Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are gathered here this afternoon to honor the life and ministry of your servant, Holly Lancaster. We confess to you that we are a grieving people, Lord. We love Holly and we miss her deeply. Death is an unwelcome enemy in this world that you originally created to perfectly reflect your glory in every way. But in this week when we have been so recently reminded of the power and promise of the resurrection, we also rejoice that we do not have to grieve today as those who have no hope. We know that because of the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ in her life, Holly is in your presence today, experiencing a foretaste of those blessings that all of your children will one day have because we are united with Christ in his life and death, and indeed his resurrection. Lord, we pray that Holly's life will be celebrated in this service of remembrance. We pray that the same gospel that changed her life and that she so faithfully shared with others from many nations will be proclaimed faithfully among us. We pray, Lord, most of all that you would be glorified in all that happens in this place this afternoon even as we trust that Holly is glorifying you from her vantage point in heaven. We offer this prayer to you in the matchless name of your Son, our Lord, and Holly's Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In a time when, uh, like this week, when we are full of so many powerful and roiling emotions, I think it is wise uh, to use the words of Scripture, the words of God, to give form to and shape to and expression to all of those emotions. Uh, so I invite us to do this now using the Scripture that's printed in your bulletin. I'll read the uh, regular print. If you all would please respond in unison reading the italicized print. No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. It is the same for all, since death comes to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As it is with the good, so it is with the sinner. Death takes us all. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see him, and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For if we have life, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
shall the King of glory see all is well all is well we not for me all is well all is well my sins forgive forgive All is well, all is well, there is no Suzanne Lancaster went to be with her Lord on Tuesday, March 29th, 2016, in Memphis, Tennessee. Born the second child of Roy and Jean Fish on August 6, 1964, in Zinnia, Ohio, Holly grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, where she graduated with honors from Southwest High School in 1982. She attended Baylor University participated in Baptist student missions in the summer of 1984, and married her sweetheart, Dan Lancaster, in 1985. Holly graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Baylor in 1986 and received a Master of Science in Biology from Texas Christian University in 1988. After working as an environmental scientist in Fort Worth, Holly, along with her husband, Dan, planted churches in Hamilton and Louisville, Texas. She taught anatomy and physiology as well as botany 
at Central Texas College and North Central Texas College. Holly was a loving mom to her four children. We all know that. Jeff, Zach, Karis, and Zane. They were born through the years 1991 to 1999. Holly moved to Burma with Dan and the four children in August of 2003 as missionaries of the International Mission Board. There she befriended Buddhists and Christians, showing the love of Christ by her quiet example. After three years of dedicated service, she moved with her family to Thailand, where she continued to minister to the Burmese people in refugee and work camps. Holly had a gift for finding those broken in spirit, and she had a gift for languages. She ministered through singing worship songs and telling Bible stories in Burmese. She knew how to bring people together, always working behind the scenes for their good and for the advancement of the gospel. Holly was an amazing wife and mother who served and loved God and her family with her whole heart, her soul, her mind, and all of her strength. In her time at Union University, she and Dan, as a team, constantly had students into their home on campus, stuffing them with pizza and giving them a glorious picture of a healthy, happy, Christ-centered marriage. Holly is predeceased by her father, Dr. Roy Fish, and survived by her husband, Dr. Daniel Lancaster, her children, Jeffrey and his wife, Linnea, Zachary, Karis, and Zane Lancaster. Her mother, Jean Fish, her brothers, Steve Fish and Jeff Fish, and her sister, Jennifer Fish Pasteur. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 read, Now we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so also we believe that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep as Christians. For we tell you this by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not go ahead of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of the command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of God. sinner lost and left to die oh raise your head for love is passing by come to Jesus come to Jesus come to Jesus and live now your burdens lifted and carried far away and precious blood has washed away the stain so sing to Jesus sing to Jesus sing to Jesus and live and like a newborn baby don't be afraid Sometimes we fall 
So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, and live. Sometimes the way is lonely and still can fill with pain. So if your sky is dark, then pours the rain. And cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, and live. Oh, and when the love spills over, and music fills the night, and when you can't contain your joy inside. And dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, and live. And with your final heartbeat, kiss the world goodbye, and go in peace. And laugh on glory's side And fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus And live Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus and When I was learning to swim, my older sister Holly stood in the pool a yard or two away, held out her arms, smiled brightly, and urged me to swim to her. And as I began swimming, she did that classic coach's maneuver and started walking backward and backward. So that instead of reaching her when I thought, I had to keep paddling, keep myself afloat for greater distance, expend more effort, and generally work a lot harder than I had planned. And when she finally stayed still long enough for me to grasp her arms, I sputtered chlorine and indignation, but Holly looked absolutely gleeful and said, see, now you did it. And her face was especially beautiful when animated with her enjoyment of teaching and imparting information, one of the many types of loving that she mastered. I grew up taking my cues from her face, the big eyes behind the glasses surrounded by copious waves of the fish hair a face usually pensive when she read and fiddled with her hair, a fish girl nervous habit. She read and she read and she read as a child, knees and elbows out in chairs, corners, couches, sitting in her bed in her little bedroom off of the kitchen hallway. My father saw early on the way that Holly interacted with books, how she plowed through them and made them part of herself and her thinking, and by extension, and discussion part of everyone who interacted with her. So he put her to work reading his type of book for a penny a page. She was barely double digits in age when she was reading biographies of Charles Finney and the other great revivalists of the 19th century. As a teenager, she would watch epic Dr. Zhivago when it came on television with one thumb and Pasternak's novel, checking up on how they did things she probably knew the novel better than the movie producers. She loved romance novels. One of my college summers, I was a receptionist and switchboard operator for a large oil well testing firm. Holly and I read Dostoevsky's The Idiot, and then we discussed it over the phone, moaning over, why did the 
last sister get everything and the first two sisters just move aside? All these questions. She was fun. And she had the ability to turn her intellectual power into illuminating, encouraging observations. I always felt like I was really a mother when I saw my children in Holly's arms. She could look at my two-year-old for about five minutes when you were visiting and say, Kate is always up for a good time, Jennifer. And Kate is. But Holly recognized and voiced this quality because she possessed it herself in abundance. For all her love of solitary activity like reading, she was inclusive in her fun. When we were children, she orchestrated an entire repertoire of games that we played after bedtime together in my room where Holly slept frequently. We called them buddy games. One of them involved me sitting on her folded up legs and feet while she lay on her back. We called it chair. And unexpectedly, the chair would extend its extremely long legs in a very quick motion and I would be launched into space, usually landing on my forehead at the foot of the bed. One time, my father heard these shenanigans going on and rushed into Jeff's room and punished him for being so insubordinately loud after bedtime. I felt kind of bad about that later. We were still carrying on like this when she was 14 years old in California. She was reading books like A Severe, Severe Mercy by then. It was her with her pillow on top of the clock radio listening to Melissa Manchester. <laughs> and... Um, I never did tell my parents why I had a gash in my scalp after she dropped me after kind of dangling me off the side of the bed and, and somehow let go. Um, we had this special buddy handshake that only she could put together where we grasped our wrists and our arms together and made sort of this star shape. But I couldn't remember how to do it. She had to put it together every time. And what I have discovered these last few years and these last few days of her life is that this sister intimacy, this acceptance of being human and celebration of it, this sense of activity and joy, I realize now and I have been realizing for so long in the years that she's been gone that this was a gift that she gave and that she opened herself to receive from many, many others. Apparently, I needed a great deal of teaching, which Holly was exceptionally good at. She pulled me into her room once just to give me a Bible study on specifically picked Ananias and Sapphira. I was never sure why. Um, she instructed me in the art of proper journaling after she illicitly read my journal when I was nine years old. Jennifer, she said, you write about your emotions and how you feel about the things that are happening. You don't just recount the things you did during the day. Um, I read her journaling too because she gave it to me later, uh, her 14 year old journal, for example. And it was full of this kind of fury and sensitivity and longing and analyzing that seemed to be now, I think, kind of a crucible for the Holly that we all know. She never minded being human, and she explored in this open and generous way all the parts of herself, all the parts of being a human being, and especially being a woman, the longing parts and the devoted to Jesus parts and the complicated parts and even the angry and misunderstood parts, all the parts of being a sister, a daughter, of being a young girl, of being a teenager. And of course, she proce processed everything through this incredible mind that she had. Everything was put in an intellectual place. Once when she was exceptionally furious at me, she was after all a human being, and called me a name. She called me a Pharisee. I think I was about 10. <laughs> at Christmas time, we had this beloved manger scene, one of those Italian ones with the mossy pieces of grass for straw at the bottom of it. And I was in consternation because the wise men kept disappearing. Where were they going? Well, Holly was removing them from the stable because after all, the wise men did not actually visit baby Jesus in the manger. It was two years later when he was older in another land, not in Bethlehem. 
so they really could not be placed in the manger scene. Holly wanted to do things right. She was a teacher's dream. She was a, she was a teacher's student. Her high school physics teacher at Southwest High School, this was a school of 2,300 students, came to her wedding. Five years after she graduated, when I was a senior, the calculus teacher, Ms. Hughes, called me Holly's name more frequently than she called me my own. But I, I didn't mind. It was only two years earlier from that, when I was 15, that she had married Dan. And I remember the night before her wedding, sitting with the other bridesmaids in someone's backyard hot tub, when I was suddenly possessed with this sense that my sister was slipping away from me, going to a land where I was not following. Recently, I stayed with her at the hospital for a week. It was the week of um, Valentine's in February, and she was trying to regain strength and the ability to eat, which, by the way, she did from not having any of those to walking and lifting weights and eating again. But at the time, we were working very hard on these things. Uh, once, it was the turn on shift of very young an inexperienced nurse who had this incredibly beautiful and carefully coiffed hair. And at one point, Holly had trouble swallowing some pills. It was kind of out of the blue. We were just sitting. It was time to take some medicine. And she choked for a moment. And the nurse stayed absolutely motionless and unhelpful. And, and I was almost afraid she hadn't noticed, although she was in the room. Um, and then Holly was fine. I was feeling a little ungenerous. It was clear to me that this nurse could spend at least as much time in empathy training as she did curling her hair every morning. <clears throat> this was not at Baptist Memorial. It was another hospital, by the way. Um, I just want to say that. But Holly's response the next time the nurse was on shift was to draw her out. She started asking questions. Well, how old are you? Where did you go to nursing school? Do you have a boyfriend? What do you like to do for fun? And the nurse's face broke out for the first time into these uncontrolled girlish smiles, and she laughed, she answered, she fidgeted, she grinned and looked at the ceiling. Rays of sunshine seemed to burst into the room. My daughter Ella said last night, my favorite part about Aunt Holly is she always smiled when she looked at you. And Holly could do this because she knew the Lord Jesus smiled when he looked at her. And that's how she could encourage with such openness and such freedom. I think the only time, well, one of the times I really saw her angry was um, she was going off to be a, a student missionary and she had just gotten engaged to Dan, the love of her life. And someone at the BSU uh, worried that perhaps because she'd just been recently engaged, she would be distracted from, from her student mission work. And this did make Holly fume, because this wouldn't be Holly. Devotion in one area of her life to Dan was all the peace with devotion in another area of life to the people on the mission field where she was going in Minnesota, Wisconsin. They all went together the crucible of early family life, um, the sister that she taught and enjoyed, her brothers, her mother and father, all of these experiences she expanded into friendship, into motherhood, and to wifehood. And they were very beautiful. In those last days that we've had with Holly this past week, we were all longing for those rays of sunshine that I saw explode in the room back in February when they were so desperately needed. And these, these loving Holly moments did come occasionally. They were hard fought, they were loving, hopeful, and sad gestures she could write to us. And we gave her some sentences to pick from. And she would always pick things like, I love you. And I remember this. Uh, Mom and Jeff and I were sitting at her bedside. She picked, I love you, and I'm okay. She was there for us, 
And at one point, towards the very end, I stood at her bedside, and I was there for Holly. And yet, like all the people who knew and enjoyed her presence, I was also there for myself. My heart was kind of quaking in the presence of the Holy Spirit on my sister. I was there in that moment, but I was also thinking about the past and the future all at once. I looked at my sister, and I felt like Marianne Dashwood in one of Holly's favorite novels. We were just talking about this last night. Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. I looked at her and I felt like I was comparing my own conduct in life with her. I was comparing it with what it should have been. I was comparing it with hers. That was Holly. And yet this was an encouraging moment all at the same time. It felt like I was reaching out to her once more during that swim lesson as a little girl. Only this time I was opening my arms and asking her to swim to me. And she was receding. She was moving away from me, asking me to try gallantly, to continue, to trust, to be open, to acknowledge I was human, to love Jesus, to love others, to not be afraid. Thank you, Holly, sister. Thank you, Lord Jesus. A reading from Psalms 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. They were filled, filled with laughter. Our tongues, they were loosed, loosed with joy. Restore us, O Lord. Restore us, O Lord. we will carry Lord please do not tarry all those who sow weeping will go out with songs of joy the nations 
visions will say he has done great things the nations will sing songs of joy restore us O Lord oh restore so I want to thank you for your, your love and your prayers and your support. And I'd like to ask you to pray for me now as I share a eulogy, a good word about a beautiful woman. I want to honor and celebrate a beautiful life a quiet force that changed this world. Holly and I met her freshman year at Baylor. I was a sophomore. I had taken a girl to a birthday party of a mutual friend, and I was going to tell that girl afterwards that I wanted to start dating her. And at that party, I met Holly. I walked them both home, and I dropped the other girl off first. <laughs> we walked up to her uh, dorm room, and we talked for a little while, and she finally, she had to go up. It was Colin's dorm there at Baylor. And I remember her, the, the, the glass door shutting, and I skipped down the steps, and I said, thank you, God, for showing me the woman I'm going to marry. Took me two years to convince her, but uh, <laughs> but during that time uh, we had uh, read a, a a book. We were reading a book together called A Severe Mercy. A uh, van and a, a young couple who had decided they were going to have the greatest love with no expectations. And Holly and I adopted that as our motto. And for a year, we did really well, but then it was really hard to not have any expectations. Uh, she was my soulmate. Her favorite color was green. 
And Holly brought spiritual life and growth wherever she went. You heard some of that from Jenny, but all over the world. I remember being in the poorest of the poor village in Myanmar, and there were some ladies there who probably hadn't bathed in, in days and were just in rags, and Holly sat in the middle of them, and she held their hand. And she just loved them. She used to go with other women into the red light district in Chiang Mai. And she helped several women come out of prostitution. And she and her friend Kara Garrison would go to Mess Sai on the border of Burma and Thailand. And they would uh, teach and they would share and they would uh, just very simple lessons. Uh, so many of you will, will smile when I say they had hand motions. <laughs> And actually, about three years after that, I was teaching in the seminary in Malaysia, and, and a, a girl came up to me. She said, listen, I'm from Burma. I'm from Burma, and I've, 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 I've learned this lesson before. And we got to talking, and her mom had gone to one of Holly and Kara's trainings and had gone home, and I found out later that literally hundreds of ladies in a whole area of Myanmar were following Jesus. And this girl had learned from her mom, and because of that and other things, she had decided to go into the ministry and was in seminary in Malaysia. That was Holly Lancaster. Her favorite hymn was Be Thou My Vision. She loved Jesus. She loved to worship. Loved to play the guitar and worship. And in her final days at the hospital, we all just, Zach had the guitar and he would sing and Dr. Hewlin and others were there would read prayers and scripture. And every time we would uh, sing, Be Thou My Vision, I just saw her eyes light up. When we were in Chiang Mai, Holly played the guitar and Zach played the guitar and Jeff played the bass and Kara sang and Zane did something. What did you do? Well, <laughs> at first I sang, and then later I stole the bass from Jeff. Yeah, that's right. And I play keyboard, and they called us the Land Fan Praise Band. <laughs> and some of Mom's greatest memories were of the family up there just leading in worship together. Do you guys mind coming up? Her favorite verse was Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the lights of, of your heart. And uh, she lived that. Uh, Jenny's already mentioned or someone's mentioned the pizza nights and we calculated up one time we fixed 2,500 pizzas so far. In Chiang Mai, we were the, the place to be on Friday night. And... Uh, by God's grace, we were kind of the place to be here on Saturday nights. I received so many Facebook messages of young missionary women who knew Holly overseas, uh, many of them from Myanmar, um, and almost to a person they've always, in the Facebook messages, they said, uh, we always, she's our model. We want to be like her. And one precious lady said, she's, she's, I've always made it my goal just to be like Holly Lancaster with my kids. When Jeff turned about two or three years old, Holly and I had an executive meeting, and we decided, you know what, it might not be bad to have a vision statement for our family. And this is the vision statement that we live, we live, and we will live, to raise up passionate spiritual leaders and bring healing to the nations. And Holly, I want you to know we did that. We did that. And Jeff, I want you to know, Mom saw such great empathy in a pastor's heart in you. And she was so proud of you and just so 
amazed at you and Naya and the husband that you are. And Naya, you're like a second daughter to us. We lost two children. And we just always feel like God gave us you, a second daughter. And you're a nurse, and you're a tender care of mom those last couple weeks, and especially those last few days. We will never forget. Zach, mom always told me she loved your art. She loved that you're an artist. She loved the deep talks you guys had. And she said, I know someday he's going to know that he has a great anointing on him to lead worship. And all the people said. And Beth, she loved your red hair. And your sweet spirit. And she she would often remark to me after you guys had left that Beth is going to be so good for Zach. Beth, can you come up here? Do you mind? Okay. Karis, you and Mom were connected at the heart. And you were partners in crime. (laughs) And she was, and you were, her best friend. You did everything together. You shopped, you ran errands, you went to symphonies, you went to ballets, you cooked. You decided what really needed to happen in our family. (laughs) You led, you shared your life together. I do not think. There is any closer mother or daughter that have ever lived. And when I think of you and your mom, I think of two sides of the same coin. And Zane, I know she wasn't at the soccer game when you scored two goals for her. But she loved to watch you play basketball. And she's going to be there watching you play soccer. And she often told me, she's so proud of you, the leader you are, and the gatherer of people you are. And so I just want to proclaim and affirm that we did raise up passionate spiritual leaders and bring healing to the nations by the grace of and the mercy of God. Amen. Can you guys see this? It's all right. It's okay. I'm all right. Yeah. Holly had two strokes last Saturday night. After the first stroke, she couldn't talk very well anymore. But I want you just to know the grace of God. Friday afternoon, the Lord just spoke to me very strongly and said, you need to set everything straight. And so Saturday morning for an hour and a half, Holly and I talked about her, a living will. We talked about did she, what did she want. If, and at that point, we had no idea what was going to happen. And it was just the grace of God. Uh, all the kids came over. It was Karis' 20th birthday party. <laughs> And from 1.30 to 3 o'clock, we all joked, and Holly got on to Zane for his biting his fingernails, and it was a, it really, it was a glorious time. We got Panda Express, because <laughs> we're missionaries. <laughs> and it was good. I had asked Jeff and Naya to stay a little bit after that, and Jeff uh, signed as an alternate on the two papers that we had done. And I went out, and I found two men who were just sitting there, and I said, would you do me a favor and come in and witness the living well of my wife? They were shy at first, but they came in, and instantly we found two brothers who loved the Lord, and after they witnessed the the living will, 
they prayed for us. And, and after they left, about 30 minutes later, Holly said, you know, I just really want to go for a walk. And I said, okay. And so we got our walker, and we were walking down the hall. And usually we just went halfway down the hall, and we would come back. But she just kept walking. And I thought, wow, okay. And so she walked, and she looked at, there's a big window at the end. And she walked to the window, and there's a big happy Easter and beautiful trees outside. And then she turned to me. And she pointed to her mouth and said she couldn't, she, she couldn't speak anymore. I yelled stroke and ran down the hall. And in, within three minutes, there were seven nurses there taking care of her. And I praised God for that. They took her down for a test. She had another stroke then. And when she came back, she couldn't speak anymore, but she could still write. And this is, these are some of the things that she wrote. I'm not afraid to die. She wrote, maybe it's my time. She wrote, no heroic measures do not resuscitate DNR. She wrote, and this is so hotly, I'm sorry. And then she wrote, I love you. And then she couldn't write anymore. She's an amazing lady. She's a quiet force. I so appreciate all of you being here and celebrating with us her graduation. One of the things Holly and I decided early on, and I want to share this with you because I really feel like she would absolutely want me to share this with you, is how she and I made decisions. The way we made decisions is we, we would pray, and it was like we were on one side of the table, and the Lord was on the other side of the table. And we had a sheet of paper and a pen. And this is how we made decisions. For 31 years, we wrote yes on the paper. And we shoved it over to the Lord. And then he told us what he wanted us to do. And I just encourage you, after 31 years of marriage to Holly, the most wonderful woman, the most beautiful woman, we live such a full life together. Because when you say that to the Lord, I mean, he does things that you could never imagine. So we're here to honor and celebrate her beautiful life quiet force that changed the world. After this service, the family's going to go and we're going to bury her in, it's called the Four Gospels Garden at the Highland Memorial Cemetery. And Holly would want me just in the ending up here to ask you, is it well with your soul? Do you know the Lord Jesus? Maybe you've seen everything that's going on today. You may have been in church all your life even. But there really is something missing. And my heart for you and Holly's heart for you would be to come to Jesus. Fly with Jesus. Walk with him. Say yes, Lord, whatever you want. How could you do that? By trusting in him, putting your faith in him, like Holly did when she was six years old. Thank you guys so much.
for your love. I can't tell you there have been so many times the last two years, Holly and I would walk out of a situation and we looked at each other and we would say, do they know we're Dan and Holly Lancaster? <laughs> we're just simple people. We're nobodies. But you guys have been so generous and so kind and made us feel like a king and a queen. Thank you so much. Let's pray together, Kim. Oh, Lord God, I thank you for Holly. I thank you for 31 incredible years with my sweet wife. I thank you for the adventures. I thank you for me and Mar, bombs and earthquakes, machine guns. I thank you for dysentery. <laughs> Lord, we just did it all together. We lived such a full life together. So I thank you for Holly. She's quiet. She's behind the scenes. But she just shows what a single life trans transfigured by you can do. And Lord, for those ladies in the red light district and those ladies all over Myanmar that highly held their hand and loved them, I pray they will come to Jesus. In Jesus' name.
God, we have come into this place with both heavy and hopeful hearts. Our hearts are heavy because we are a people who are surrounded by sin and death. At the same time, our hearts are hopeful because we know that Christ has defeated sin and death. We long for the return of the risen Christ. Indeed, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. We believe that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And God, as we leave this place, we encourage each other with these words. And God, you have said to us in your word that you are near to the brokenhearted and that you save those who are crushed in spirit. And Lord, as much as we love Dan and Jeff and Naya and Zach and Karis and Zane, we know that you love them so much more than we ever could. And we ask that you would wrap your arms of love around them. We know that you are the God of all comfort, and you comfort us in all our afflictions. Lord, we thank you for your comfort. And we ask that you would comfort this dear family in days ahead. As we leave this place, we're confident of what you have told us in your word that there is coming a day when a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels will be standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they will fall on their faces before the throne and worship God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. You're dismissed.